All right. All right. So thank you all for joining us uh, for this very important conversation around uh, race and culture and education. Um, it's an important conversation for us to have. It's timely considering uh, a lot of the things that have been brought to the surface with COVID-19. Um, but in all honesty, a lot of these things have existed for uh, decades and even generations. And so we're hope, hoping that the conversation that we're getting ready to have, the conversations that I will share with uh, the panelists here, will help not only provide all of you with uh, added layers of thought, but also with actions that we can take now, that we can take this fall, and that we can take going forward to essentially uplift the entire educational community. Um, I've got a number of specific questions uh, targeted towards each of the panelists who bring a wealth of information, expertise, and experience to share with all of you. And then also we have a Q&A set up that you are more than welcome to share some of your thoughts in the Q&A, share some questions. Uh, we've dedicated some time towards the end of this session to address a few of the questions. Sadly, we won't be able to do all of them, but we will for sure be able to address several of them towards the end. And then we're on the social medias, especially on Twitter. Um, our hashtag is uh, G-E-T-A. And then feel free to include uh, we are Q, uh, and then also Microsoft EDU. But the primary hashtag we will use is G-E-T-A. So uh, I will share with you all, my name's Ken Shelton. If I haven't had an opportunity to interact with any of you on the social medias or virtually or in person, uh, I come from Los Angeles, California. I worked in education for over well over 20 years, and I was a classroom teacher in the Los Angeles Unified School District for over 18 years. So, um, but this isn't about me, this is about the panelists. And uh, I'm thrilled to welcome three of my uh, wonderful and amazing friends who are um, phenomenal practitioners in the work that they do. And so what I'd like to do is kind of do a slight round table with them just so that you all can learn a little bit more about them and what their roles are. And uh, you'll see why they are a part of this critical and important conversation. So what I'd like to do is first uh, shift over to uh, Dr. Natasha Rochelle so that she could share a little bit about what her role is and what her background is. And you'll be able to see how that's framed into our conversation. So Dr. Natasha Rochelle. Good morning, everyone. So good to be here with you all today. Um, as Ken said, I am Dr. Natasha Rachel. Thank you for throwing the doctor in there, Ken. I appreciate it. Um, I am a, I believe this is my 17th year in education. I'm an alternatively certified high school science teacher turned into the ed tech space. And I am a digital learning specialist for Atlanta Public Schools. And it's the best job ever. I get to interact with teachers and students. Um, and I'm just really excited to be here with you all today to continue this um, conversation. I actually grew up in Southern California and live in Atlanta now, so I've got the best of both worlds. I say I'm a Cali girl in a Georgia world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and I, I apologize. I I meant to say racial, but at any rate, I apologize. Um, so thank you. And so now, what I'd like to do is shift over to. Um, Fernando Chavez so that he can share with you a little bit about his background and part of the reason why he's a part of this conversation. So I still have that. Hello, good morning. I'm Fernando Chavez coming to you from Los Angeles, California, South LA to be specific. Um, I've been a teacher for over 15 years. I'm a teacher of diverse learners and I say diverse learners. It's more commonly known as a special education teacher. Um, yeah, nationally board certified. I have a master's degree in multicultural multilingual education, and I'm excited to be with you all here today. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, and then our final panelist, uh, who is also, I'll let her share, share with you where she's from, because you'll see a theme with all three of the uh, <laughs> panelists here. But um, our next panelist is uh, Alicia, Alicia Johal. Um, and so please, Alicia, if you don't mind, share with the audience your background and a little bit about why you're here as well, please. Yeah, thank you all and thanks for, for having me here today. Um, I am also in Southern California, so I'm in San Diego. I was actually, I have to rep another place because it's what we do, but I was born and raised in Canada. So, you know, I have to, uh, yeah, Natasha, I know that about you. I didn't think you knew that about me, so I was excited to see your reaction. Um, so. <laughs> So um, Canadians do have a lot of pride, of course. Um, so I now am um, in San Diego. This is my 
ninth year as an educator. So I've primarily taught middle school science. And this year I've transitioned while also teaching middle school robotics to uh, an administrative role. So I'll, I'm currently the assistant director of innovation at my school here in San Diego. Um, outside of my, my K-12 work, I'm really passionate about new teacher education. Uh, I, I teach in two uh, higher ed programs, mentoring and supporting candidates that are getting their science teaching credentials, and then also as a new teacher induction mentor once they get in the classroom. So I, I'm just very passionate about, you know, the connection between K-12 and higher ed and uh, the lack thereof, you know, sometimes and, and trying to bridge that together. And so I'm excited to, to share with you all and, and be here so thank you so much thank you very much and thank you to all three of you for being a part of this panel um, i knew when i asked all three of you to be a part of the panel you wouldn't tell me no because we're all such <laughs> good friends uh, and so uh, for the audience so a couple of things before i drive into the first question Part of the reason why we're having this conversation is, as you can see, all of the panelists do come from uh, a wide range of backgrounds, uh, their experiences, their roles in education. Um, but there's a common thread that we all have in regards to our educational experience. And so what I want to do is give you a little foundational uh, framework to understand uh, the basis of the next question. And um, I think the first question I will uh, direct towards uh, Fernando. So before I hand it over to Fernando for this question, it's important to understand the two elements of what we are discussing here, and they are the impact and the effects that race and culture have on education, on our educational experiences and on education in general. And so what I want to do first is kind of share with you all a little bit of a foundational understanding of what culture is. And so I break culture into three distinct uh, areas. There are those that are the obvious and low mental intensity, what are things like the music that we listen to, the clothes we wear, the food we eat, and things of that nature. The next layer are the things that are somewhat visible, but a slightly higher degree of mental intensity, which are some of our cultural norms around in regards to our speech patterns, the vernacular that we use, uh, the way we greet each other, the distance that we uh, stand apart and when we're having interpersonal communications uh, and things like that. And then there's the more deeply rooted uh, things that are not so obvious, that are of, of a significantly higher mental intensity, which are things like uh, our concepts of pain, um, our concepts of, of success, um, things <laughs> like how we uh, view others, the biases that we have, and, and those areas. So I could go into more detail, but this is really about the panelists. So the first question I do want to direct towards uh, Fernando is, how has your cultural identity and even your race affected you in regards to your schooling or even your professional role as an educator? Uh, that's, a, that's a really, really deep question. Um, off the top of my head, um, I think my schooling, um, coming from a family of undocumented people, my, both of my parents are from Mexico. They both came from Jalisco. Uh, my dad was a musician. My mom uh, worked in uh, restaurants. And going to school at four years old, it became a journey into finding myself, into figuring out how I fit in, in what, what I was told was a melting pot that is America. Um, it was like it was like I was meshing two worlds together. You know, I had my home life, which is completely different from my school life. Um, when I when I would go <clears throat> to Mexico. Um, I would be completely different than my relatives. They have a term called uh, ni de aquí ni de allá, neither from here nor there. So it was a process of going to school and figuring out how I fit in. And I had to start figuring that out. Now, I didn't have the wherewithal to understand what was happening, but I had the sense of feeling where I need to figure out how I fit in. And that was thrusted upon me when I was four years old. Coupled with that, fast forward, once I started kind of getting my bearings, uh, I went to a high school that was a predominantly white high school uh, in, a, in another part of town. So I was bused from the from the segregated um, brown part of, Los, of La, the Los Angeles, San Fernando Valley to a whiter part of the San Fernando Valley for a better opportunity. And my high school uh, experience was sandwiched by two things in California that happened, which was one, Prop 187, and uh, the other one is Prop 209. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with California politics, propositions are uh, basically like public voting on law. Rather than having uh, elected officials vote on law, 
In California, if you have enough signatures, you can place a, a proposed law on a ballot box and the people themselves vote on that law. The first one was my freshman year, which is Prop 187, which denied public services to undocumented people. We're talking about um, school, health care, um, and, and welfare benefits. So in, in that then, right then and there, going to a predominantly white high school, I felt I was personally under attack, even though this was my country. This was what I, the country I was born in. Um, then fast forward to Prop 209. Prop 209 abolished affirmative action in, um, in uh, California. So therefore, I no longer was able to get uh, an easier path to higher learning. So those things were constantly thrust upon me and I internalized those things. Fast forward to, I got, I, I, I graduated, I got into UCLA, I graduated from UCLA without affirmative action. So, uh, and then I decided to become an educator. Now my role as an educator, I wanted to right a lot of the wrongs that I felt growing up. And one of the things I quickly realized in terms of race and culture is that even though I was told oftentimes that, you know, my race and culture is a monolith, it's not a monolith. I don't necessarily represent my community. I just represent Fernando Chavez and I have my own thoughts and feelings and perspective on things. And so when I got into school uh, and I became an educator and I, and I saw students that looked like me, that came from similar backgrounds, but yet they didn't react the same way I would have when I was a kid, I quickly realized that we are all unique in our own way. So in that sense, it's been a process of deprogramming myself and deprogramming a lot of the biases that I had internalized subconsciously throughout my schooling. Thank you, Fernando, for sharing that. And I do think it's important for all of us to recognize before I shift over to um, Alicia for this, for the to respond to the question, and I'll repose the question. But I do think it's important for all of us to recognize as educators that all of our students have a unique story to them that we want to, you know, it's an old saying, I, it's a saying that I like to share with educators is not only do you not want to judge a book by its cover, but you actually should take the time to read the stories. Uh, and so uh, all of our students have unique challenges, unique backgrounds, unique um, assets that they bring in. And we want we want to be in a position to help ourselves support our students in the, them actualizing what their assets are, not necessarily defaulting to, uh, as Fernando just shared, that all of our students under a particular cultural or racial demographic are a monolith. So um, Alicia, I'd love to uh, for you to share some of your thoughts around how has your cultural identity and race affected your uh, life experiences and then even your experiences as an educator? Yeah, actually, there's a lot of parallels uh, to what Fernando has experienced. So um, when I would walk into a classroom in Vancouver, where I where I spent about half of my life, uh, people knew right away what I was. I'm a Punjabi girl. I'm Sikh. Um, and those two pieces of me were very um, well known because I lived in a community where there were a lot of Punjabi Sikh people. And so if you don't know what Punjabi means, it's um, uh, it means I'm from the state of northern India, which is called Punjab. Right. And Sikh is my religion, but I, we're an ethno religious group. So 90 percent of the people you will meet that are Sikh are likely from Punjab. Um, in Vancouver, we have the we have a huge population of, of Punjabi Sikhs. And so people would look at you and they'd know who you were. They knew what language you spoke. They probably knew your family. Um, it, I, I grew up in a very diverse city of Vancouver, like a suburb of Vancouver. And so I got to experience that all the way through middle school where I never had to tell someone how to pronounce my name. I never had to explain where I was from. I never had to uh, be confused with somebody else. Uh, and I knew the dominant language. We spoke English and we spoke Punjabi and, and that was kind of it. And then I moved to Southern California and I moved here right before eighth grade. So middle school is a very tough time to move for anybody, you know, and I'm here in Southern California and automatically um, my name is pronounced different. So instead of being Alicia Thunbreath Johal, I'm Alicia Yohal. And I was like, hold on a second, right? So nobody could, could look at me and figure out what I was. And I do blend in and I look Hispanic. I live in San Diego, so I, I owned that. Um, but it was a struggle because 
I, for the first time in my life, I had to define who I was. I had to explain who I was. I had to figure out who was I going to be in the school when there was not another Indian person there. Um, and my brother was two years younger than me, but he was still in elementary school, so I don't even have him. Um, and so it was it was a challenge, and I don't think I ever really thought that I would have had to do that. I thought that everybody knows who I am. I don't I don't know why I need to explain it. And it was different when I came here. Um, and it was tough in school because I felt it more so after school. So during school, you know, I was very you know, studious. I loved science. I, I, I loved uh, being in class. I loved school. So in class, you know, I worked hard, but I was definitely like sort of like the, the quiet, you know, um, the quiet student who did all the work, turned in all the assignments on time, didn't really participate in STEM classes, but that's a whole different conversation about brown girls in STEM, which we can get into another time. Uh, but I knew my stuff and I was really good at studying. Um, after school, I, I grew up playing soccer in Canada, so I came here and I thought I'm going to join the soccer team. Um, and I had to tell my coaches like three, four, five times a week that I don't know Spanish. So when they're talking to the whole team, I don't know what he's saying. And they rolled their eyes and they brushed it off and they thought that I was a Mexican person who chose not to learn Spanish. And that and and they and those students were treated differently too, because very similar to Fernando's story, they were trying to figure out who am I at school. But I was like, look, I'm nothing against it. I just don't know Spanish. I know French and y'all don't know French. So what do I what do I do with this other language that I have? And so it was it was tough. I definitely felt like an outsider um when I when I moved, but I think that that has opened my eyes up incredibly because as soon as I became a teacher, I did not assume someone was really anything when they walked in the door and don't get me wrong we all have our biases and we 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 have to check ourselves sometimes and I will own that but it's it's become a reality where where I've just been aware of what it feels like to know to know that everybody knows you and who you are and they know your identity and your culture to then having the opposite uh, and they are they're very different worlds to live in very hard to navigate as a teenager um, and it's it's impacted a lot of the work that I do now specifically around uh, young women in STEM, young women of color in STEM, and 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 advocating for that voice uh, that you don't really hear in class because they're probably just you know sitting in the corner doing all the work you know and and participating in that way. So that's kind of kind of where I've been in terms of my own race and culture um, in in education and and where I stand now as an educator too. Thank you very much for sharing that. And uh, you know, in, again, and. I want to shift to the next question and uh, address that to uh, Natasha. Um, but what you, what you all, for the audience, what you all have heard is not only two distinctly rich uh, and different stories, but hopefully you're able to make the connection on the experiences that um, that Alicia and Fernando had in distinctly geographically different areas and coming from different cultural identities. And it's important for us to recognize that, <clears throat> you know. Um, our culture is our identity and there is varying degrees of of what we identify with that is a part of our culture and um, and a byproduct of that also is race. And so there's two things to be mindful of when it comes to this, which my next question will go again to Natasha is the difference between a racial identity and a racialized identity. And that is, how do I view myself, i.e. what is my race? And then how do others view me? What is my racialized identity? And then in terms of that, when it comes to education, which will lead me to this question for Natasha, is the fact that we, it's important for us to recognize <coughs> and understand that race is socially constructed. There are so many things that impact and influence what we do as individuals uh, and then what happens in education that is based on something that is socially constructed. There's no scientific proof behind race, among other things. And so for Natasha, I'd like to pose this question for you to share your thoughts and ideas with the uh, the audience here is um, how does race affect education in general? Um, and then in terms of that, how does culture play a role in that whole uh, overall context? For Natasha, please. Thank you very much for that. Um, 
I absolutely love this question. Um, I am actually listening to White Fragility on audiobook right now, and I've read it before, but I'm, I've, I'm listening to it on audiobook. And one of the things that I listened to this weekend that I have been saying and saying and saying, but it, it's the way that it was posed, and I actually have it right here. Um, race plays such a huge part in education and what the author of this book says is that when you refuse to acknowledge seeing color so when you refuse to acknowledge the races of your students um you're not able to see racism right so when you say that you don't see color you're projecting your experience onto your students which is not necessarily their reality and so that really stuck with me so much so that I, I jotted it down um, in my phone. My experience will always be different than, for example, my white teacher. And I actually on Facebook this past weekend, as I'm listening to this book, put a question. I said, hey, I'm just curious. I'm listening to this book. When was what grade were you in when you had your first black teacher? For me, it was not until I got to college. I had one black substitute teacher in the fourth grade, but my K-12 experience were all white teachers. And so when I was listening to this piece of this audiobook and I posed that question, which the author also asks in the book, I was like, wow. And it made me think about were my teachers projecting their experiences onto me, which was not necessarily my reality. Um, I too have a very diverse background. I won't get all into it, but I was born in England. My father is Jamaican. My mother is half black and half white. Um, I view myself as black. Um, I am three quarters black, one quarter white, but I'm black. And I don't know, like growing up in Southern California, my mom and I, whenever we would be in, in grocery stores or whatever, people would speak to us in Spanish. We're very fair skinned, dark hair. People thought we were Spanish and we're like, no, we don't understand. Um, so how others view me, I've been viewed as everything, everything under the rainbow, but I'm definitely black. I don't say African-American because I'm not an American citizen. Surprise for those of you that don't know me, I am a Canadian citizen still. Um, and then the part, second part of that question, how does culture play a role in education? It's huge. I think a lot of, um, we have a responsibility as educators and teachers to make sure that all of our students feel comfortable in our classrooms. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love about, and I know we're, you know, we're all over the place here, but that's one of the things that I absolutely love about um, Microsoft. For students that Fernando teaches or students that we all teach, there's so many built-in tools that make education accessible for all of our students, whatever their reading level is, whatever their, just whatever they need, it's their built-in for them. And so we have a responsibility as educators to make sure that all of our students feel welcome in our classes and that we make learning accessible for all of them. Thank you for sharing that. And um, what I'd like to do is um, go to Alicia um, to kind of give your thoughts on um, how does race uh, play a role in education and even culture um, as a byproduct of that role, please. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, just to sort of to, to piggyback off of what Natasha said and, and what I said earlier, I think there's uh, we don't talk about race in school, right? So, so let's just name that. <laughs> we don't talk about it. So whatever my answer is going to be about right now is, uh, is, what, is what I do when I'm uh, internalizing, you know, race or what I'm doing when I'm interacting with students. What am I doing when, when I am you know, planning curriculum that's, that's for everyone in the classroom? But I think the tough part is, 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 the tough part for me, at least, is we don't talk about it enough, or if at all, and then when we do, it often falls on the weight of the person of color in the conversation to drive the conversation forward safely. And and, and so it's a lot of work, right? So so let's just name that. It, it's hard to do. Uh, personally, I find it easier to talk to students about it than I do with, with, with adults. Um, I, I think that... Um, with with different schools that I've been at, um, when when we engage in the classroom, once you've set up a, a safe and collaborative and inclusive and restorative environment for your students, you can you can engage in topics. And so I think for me, um, when I know we're gonna we're gonna talk about this later, but when I'm imagining culture as it impacts race in, in schools and in our classrooms, um, you know. 
the, the word intersectionality just keeps coming up in my head, right? Because I, I don't know how to share one part of myself with you. I don't because it's impossible and then that wouldn't be me, right? So, you know, this is, this is, and I need to own too that this is coming from the work of black women. The fact that I can name that as an Indian woman is the work that's been done before now, right? So I can tell you I'm, I'm, I'm Punjabi. I'm from Northern India. I'm I'm a dual citizen of Canada and America. You know, my my dad is from Fiji, so part of our family identifies as Fijian. My mom's also from England. Natasha, we're like really in, in line today. This is good. You know, um, I'm I'm Sikh. I'm a I was a biology major. You know, I I teach in higher ed. I I'm a sister. I, I'm an aunt. Right? Like, there's so much to me that that I that I just wish that we could tear down some of the structures in schools to let more of our kids come in, right? Um, and, and for it to be twofold, right, where, where, where teachers can share and then students are like, okay, I can share too, right? Because one thing is to ask your students to be vulnerable, but as educators, if we're not doing that as well, uh, then I think you've created a harmful space for kids. We're like, no, I need you to share your story, but I'm going to be here and be the professional about this. And, and, and so I think we get lost along the way somewhere here um, when we talk about culture because it's we lean into certain parts of it but i don't know if i've ever been in a space in my life education or not where my entire my entire culture got to be there there's some things about me that i have to sort of push to the side where i'm like okay i don't feel comfortable sharing that or i don't know if that's okay for me to share right now um and there's some stuff that i can lean into you know and so uh, for me it sort of feels like um a I don't want to say it's like a dance, but I, you're definitely in situations and at work and outside of work where you're like, okay, this is who I am. This is who's here. These are the parts of me I can share. This is I'm not okay with sharing. I just need to be good and safe and comfortable right now. So, and I think that that is what our students do all day, right? We and then I just imagine little schoolers. They go they go from one class to another, six classes a day with some schools. And they are navigating a new space with a new teacher, with different kids in the class and a different climate environment. And I think they too are turning off and on parts of their culture and probably their race because they don't know how to be in all those spaces at the same time. Um, and I think that's a 30,000 foot view. That's where schools can focus on, you know, is how do we make it so that when they're going from math to science to history to PE to their art class, that they get to be who they are and they don't have to polish up for us. You know, like, who are we to put that on kids? So I don't know if I answered your question, Ken, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, so, so you did. And I, I think you, you brought up several important things and it's a perfect segue to the next question that I'm actually gonna pose to um, Fernando. And that, yeah, there's several things you shared that I think is important for all of us who are a part of this to um, really give some thought to is the fact that our identities are very complex and they are fluid, they're dynamic. We, we, you know, we, we develop certain ways of protecting ourselves, especially if we are students of a uh, historically marginalized background. Uh, and, and that, that in manifests itself in, in, in a variety of ways. And you just pointed out one where in many cases, I know I can relate to it that, you know, if you go to different classes, I'm a different person based on the teacher, the subject matter and my classmates in the classroom. And I think it's really important for um, for our audience here and for all of us to really be mindful of the fact of the word that you just used, which is a perfect segue to the next question, and that is intersectionality. So first of all, for the audience, intersectionality is a word that was coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who um, I don't know if she still is, but I know she was a professor at UCLA for a while, go Bruins. Um, okay. and, and ultimately the history behind that word was in her research, she looked up uh, a court case, which was the Graffin Reed versus General Motors. And ultimately, to give you all a little historical context around the origins of that word intersectionality, is that was a court case where a large block of, of uh, black women were fired from the job. And so they filed a lawsuit um, as to, you know, for wrongful termination. And the first lawsuit filed was they were fired because they were women. And then the lawsuit got thrown out because the judge said, well, no, they're still women that are employees at General Motors. Then they refiled the lawsuit um, saying that they were fired because they were black women. Then the judge threw that out and said, well, no, there's black men who are still there. And so that's where that whole idea around intersectionality started is that we're not, 
you know, and as Fernando mentioned earlier, we're not a monolith and our cultural identity is not only dynamic and fluid, but it's very complex. And so there's varying degrees of intersectionality <coughs> as to who we are and what we bring uh, to our to the spaces that we go into. And and for the audience here, as you all can see, now, now you're starting to get hopefully a better idea as to why the three panelists are not only very, very dear friends of mine, um, but I have such a tremendous amount of of love and respect for the work that they do, um, not just because of their contributions to education, but also because when we spend time together, they are bringing their whole selves, which ultimately for me, I benefit from them being their whole selves because I learn more about them. I learn more about their experiences, which helps frame more of my, broadens my perspective and understanding, not just of, of them as individuals aligned with their cultural identity, but also their roles in education. And so that leads me to the next question that I wanna pose to Fernando now is, now that we understand intersectionality and all three of you have been able to share uh, you know, details about your background, your upbringing, your schooling experience, I want to take that word and apply it to education in general and look at how does intersectionality play a role in, in education in general uh, and more specifically your personal experiences as an educator? Wow. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ken, for uh, such a... Uh such a uh, ego boost. I always appreciate talking to you. But yeah, um, yeah, it's extremely important to come as an educator and understand the complexities of culture and race. Um, I think there is, I think I want to harken back to one of my uh, heroes in education, Jane Elliott. I don't know if those of you who are unfamiliar with Jane Elliott, do yourself a favor and just Google her and consume as much as you can of Jane Elliott. And one of the things she said was, if you made it through our educational system without being racist, it is an absolute miracle. Because in order to function in the educational system, you have to internalize a lot of white male supremacist uh, beliefs. If you let, let me get let me talk about uh, social studies. If if you are if you are reading any sort of history book, even currently, you would think as a young person that the only but the only people that accomplish anything are white males. So it is the it is understanding that civilization and where we are today have been an amalgam of the world uh, being combined together. Now, uh, in ter um, I want to touch on a few things that were mentioned previously in terms of intersectionality. Um, I think there is a lot of inherent bias in teachers. So I think it's important not only to tell teachers that they need to make students feel comfortable regardless of what kind of uh, kind of ways they identify themselves, whether it be uh, either their uh, the four, the race, class, gender, and uh, sexual orientation. Um, but I think they also need to combat their own specific bias. And what do I mean by that? It's like oftentimes teachers do feel that they are trying to make students feel comfortable. The students are just not accepting their their kind of approach. Whereas they're not internalizing or understanding that they are bringing their own specific bias and it and their intent might be there. So, but the students are not understanding their intent. And I think that's intent is one of the things that people need to let go of. Who nobody it, your, your intent when you're dealing with students in education, your intent is irrelevant. You can have the best intentions, but at the end of the day, if you fell short of reaching your students you failed and you have you need to acknowledge that you failed um i i like right now unfortunately you know we're we're through social distancing i don't have access to being with my students on a daily basis but i'm a math teacher i teach uh, uh sdc math and one of the things that i would probably do if if uh we were in session was forget about the math lesson for now i would take time out of my uh curriculum and really just talk to my students about what's going on. You know, that kind of SEL, social emotional learning. Because I, I don't remember who taught me how to read, but I do remember a lot of the conversations and how teachers made me feel. The, that, the, the, the learning, the accumulation of education, that'll come. The, the learning will take care of himself, but for students to feel safe, regardless of what they identify with is super important. A lot of people say that they're inclusive, 
but oftentimes have biases towards people that don't even realize. The most dangerous biases are the ones that you don't realize you have. And just like Alicia said, I don't know if I answered your question, but. <laughs> you know, thank you. Um, and whether you all are directly answering the question is, is honestly, it's irrelevant to what you're sharing, um, but you actually are. Uh, and I think it's important. You brought up an important point, and then I want to shift uh, another part of this question over to um, Natasha, is the fact that, um, one, first of all, biases, we all have them. All of us do. And it is critical and uh, for us to recognize that. You know, one of the big things that I share uh, with educators in the, the workshops I lead and things like that is that is recognizing that, you know, in order to identify something, you got to name it first. And so it's not it's not a it's not an indictment on yourself to acknowledge that you have biases. What we want to do is be mindful of what are my biases? How can I increase my awareness of them? And then in turn, do my biases adversely affect, you know, those that I love, those that I spend time with or the students that I'm responsible for, whatever your role is in education. Um, and so then in, with, in terms with that, what I want to do is uh, shift over to um, Natasha to kind of share a little bit around, you know, especially with your role. Have you noticed how or what are the ways you see how internet intersectionality plays a role in uh, in the students that you've worked with? So thank you for that. Um, I have worked in two different school systems here in the metro Atlanta area. Um, and I think it's just important to note that here in Metro Atlanta, we are predominantly African American. Um, and so we have both of the districts that I've worked in, there's been, and I think this is pretty much consistent across the country, um, north end of the district and south end of the district. And so the differences that kind of exist there. Um, I think it's super important to recognize that we are teaching the highest of the highest um, economically and the lowest of the lowest socioeconomically and everything in between. And we really do need to be better stewards to our students and make sure that we are making sure again that they all feel safe, that we um, are able to establish that trust with our students no matter who we're teaching. Um, a lot of our students are coming to school. The meals that they eat at school may in fact be the only the meals that they eat every single day. Um, and we may only we may be the only positive adult that they have connection with every single day. And so regardless of where they stand in regard to race, gender, sexual prep, uh, orientation or preference or whatever, we really have a, a huge responsibility to make sure that they trust us, that we care for them, and that they know that they're in a safe space. And, and um, we see it every day, every school that I walk into, every classroom I walk into, we see it every single day. Um, and I just I just think that that's just priority number one. Um, just a personal story really quickly. Um, my son is actually dealing with a situation at his school now, my 10th grader who's going into the 11th grade um, this school year coming up. And about a month and a half ago, there was a video that surfaced on the internet. It's like national news of a white student making a racial slur and pointing a toy gun at the camera and insinuating that this is what he uses to kill black people only he didn't say black people he said something else um and so now there's um that in the midst of everything else that's going on in the world there's just a huge responsibility on me as a parent um, and also as someone in the community to make sure that our students feel safe going back to school um, and so we are dealing with that situation now, um, which leads to a whole other thing about SEL having to be in schools, like huge priority in the fall. Um, and what does that work look like? So that's kind of a little bit about, I again, I hope I answered your question, um, but huge need for that SEL work to go on to make sure that all of our students do feel supported and cared for and that they know that they can trust us as well. Thank you. And, you know, and then to add, and I'm going to, because we're doing good on time, I'm going to share the next question in a moment that I would love to allow time for all three of you to kind of share your thoughts around. Um, also for the audience, you know, keep in mind, there's a couple of things that have been mentioned at this point, and that that is the following is one being aware of uh, the biases that we all have, the intersectionality between race and culture uh, in ourselves and in our educational spaces that we work within. And then Fernando brought up another critical thing, which is the 
the um, the awareness of the social and emotional health of our students and recognizing that the social and emotional health of our students may in fact be something like pausing the curriculum to have the conversations that are important that you know, it's hard for adults in many cases to navigate um, complex things that are part of the dynamic uh, component to the world and the changing world. It's even harder for our students who, if they don't have the experiential framework to draw upon, to be able to identify why things are happening, when they're happening, who they're affecting, and why they're affecting, you know, maybe one specific demographic or cultural group more so than another. And it's also why, you know, I will share with everyone before I shift to this next question, you know, when it comes to social and emotional health of our students, it's very important that we don't do what I identify as is called the spiritual bypass. Um, and the spiritual bypass is the, which many of you probably have heard it now is, can't we just love everybody? That's the spiritual bypass, because what you're doing is it's a type of what I call emotional gaslighting, because what you're doing is you're saying, I don't want to talk about something that we need to talk about. So my default is a resort to, well, let's just love everyone. Yeah, that's fine. We can love everyone. But part of the love is being able to have the conversation, to be able to demonstrate degrees of vulnerability, be able to demonstrate uh, degrees of vulnerability of a lack of experiential understanding. You know, that's the thing I think for all of us as educators is that you don't know everything. It's OK to acknowledge that you don't know everything. And in turn, as you all have heard from all three of the panelists here, which we'll go into the next question in a moment, they're rich. They've got some rich stories to share in regards to their background, their experiences, their expertise, what they would bring into any type of a learning environment, which is why I think it's critical for us to recognize the, the importance of being a culturally responsive educator. And that is validating the identity of all of our students and not, and part of that validation is that your cultural identity is required as a component for to advance group learning. So with that being said, what I want to do is shift over into the next part of the question is for all three of you, and we'll start off with Alicia on this one, is we kind of touched on, on race and culture. We kind of touched on the intersectionality of the two. You all have shared your backgrounds. We're all working, we're all educators. We work with educators. We also work with students. How might we be mindful of the impact that race and culture have on our colleagues and then those effects on our students? And then I'm gonna add one layer to that. Does technology play a role in that? And how can we, how might we support our colleagues in their growth in those areas? I feel like I got the hard question to answer first. Oh, all three of you. <laughs> um, all right, I will answer this as best as I can. So, first things first, colleagues, right? I think that you, there has to be a level of trust for any of this work to happen. Uh, if I only see you uh, in the staff room at lunchtime and we just, you know, exchange and check in and, and that's kind of it, probably not going to share there. If I see you passing in the hallways or I see you at the monthly faculty meeting, probably we don't have a lot of trust. Not that I don't trust you, uh, it's just that we haven't built a relationship yet. I think that this work requires systems put in place at school for the school to build the culture and climate that it wants. If you don't build it, the students will build it. And that's not always bad. Sometimes the students can come in and 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 show us what what they need. But also as as educators, as leaders, as people who decide to walk into a school every day, there have to be systems set in place where this type of dialogue can happen between colleagues, where there is structured time that is set, where there is support, whether it's um, led by somebody or whether it's just like a circle, like let's just sit and talk and, and, and you start small, right? You don't all meet up in a staff of 40 and expect to become best friends after one team bonding activity, right? It's got to be intentional. It, it's got to be specific. It's It can't just be um, in silos. And I think that that is, that is something that I've noticed in, in every school that I've worked at. There's just never enough time in the school schedule and the way it's currently set up um, for many different factors for teachers to really connect with each other and, and have an opportunity to build that trust. Because if, if I can't, 
share my story, like I shared a snippet with you all today of, of who I am, um, but sometimes I'll, I'll be working in a school and that's all that people know about me too. And I've worked there for years and they've worked there for years, right? And so what can we do first to build in time for teachers to do this? Because I do not believe that there's a, that people don't want to get to know each other at school. I think that it's tough to talk about what needs to be talked about, but I also think that if we provided the time and the support to do it, people would lean into that. Um, and, and so that's the, the first part of the question. I'm trying to remember like the three parts to your question, Ken. I, I think I just answered the colleague part. So then I guess, oh, then you said, how does that impact the students, right? So then if, if you've got that relationship built with a colleague and you feel safe encountering that space with them, It'll be it'll be easier to do it with your kids. So, for example, the last school I worked at, we did a lot of great work around uh, restorative justice and restorative practices, and it was fantastic because it was built into the school day. It wasn't like, oh, you go to that class to do that emotional stuff. It was built into science. It was built in everywhere. Now, I was terrified to run my first restorative circle with my students alone, right? It was 36 kids, and I was like, what are we going to talk about? What if someone says something that I don't know how to answer? How do I do it? And I had a colleague at my school who had been trained in it. And she said, how about I come in and I just sit there? You know, we, we planned it out first together, her and I, but she said in the actual circle, I'll just come and sit there. Uh, and she's the assistant principal of the school, right? And so right away, the assistant principal comes into your class. The kids are like, oh, what did we do now? You know, and I had to preface it with she's she's here with us because she we're trying something new and I needed a little bit of support. And so I'm just transparent from the beginning with my kids. Um, and it went phenomenally because she was there to support me, so I relaxed. She helped guide and respond when I didn't need to. And then the kids responded with, the next Friday, we had another circle, and they said, well, we can't do it because she's not here. She was here last time, you know? And I was like, you really want the assistant principal in our class every Friday? But, but they did. And so in that class, in second period science, our assistant principal came in and joined the circle in the morning every period. Right. And, and so you do have the people on campus. You just have to find them. And when you lean into them and you say, I need a little help, I'm a little nervous. You know, even as a woman of color, I, I was teaching predominantly students of color. And even I was like, I don't know how to approach this because I haven't done this before. Um, and so I think if, if if the trust is there with colleagues, if people are trained, you know, the, the reason she was able to support me was because she was trained um, over the course of a year in a program um, that she knew how to do it and do it well. And so I, I think those are the two things that I would I would I would hope to see more. So I, I just want to see that more in schools where the time is built in and the training and the support is built in. Because if you have those two things, it's going to trickle down into your classrooms because when teachers feel supported, they're going to say, oh, yeah, I want to do that on Monday. And that's what happened. People heard about what we were doing and they're like, oh, I want to do that in my science class. I want to do that in math. Um, and it became like a, a thing that we did. So, yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you. And, you know, you brought up two key things and I'm going to shift over to Natasha and then we'll follow up with Fernando um, is the fact that, you know, for any school leaders that are watching this or that are um, tuned in to the live version of this, is Alicia just shared, you have to be intentional in allowing the space for these conversations and this growth to occur. It's if, if you wait for it to occur organically, as Alicia just shared, and by the way, I appreciate you sharing your degrees of vulnerability around this, that it's highly unlikely to occur except for maybe in a few silos of, of teachers on your campus or within your district that already have that built-in degree of, of trust. Um, I also think that it's critical for us to recognize that, you know, there's the the areas of trust and confidentiality that have to come along with having those conversations uh, so that teachers know that, you know, if I'm demonstrating degrees of vulnerability, that it's not going to be met with any degree of, of retaliatory action or punitive action. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that unfortunately is a space that a lot of us as educators, especially those of us that are educators of color, we have to be mindful of. Uh, and so then I want to shift over to Natasha real quick, just to share more around, you know, supporting colleagues and even supporting students in their growth in having these types of conversations. Um, can you share just some of your thoughts around this? And then uh, one of the things I want to uh, add into this is, you know, because we all are big tech people, does technology actually play a role in this as well? Please, Natasha. 
Thank you very much for that. Um, I do want to say I think it's super important that there is leadership from the top down of any of our school districts across the country. Um, I was super, super thankful that when all of this I don't want to say all of it started because it's been going on for a long time, but when we just started going through all of this here in Atlanta, our superintendent sent all of us an email, an email blast and said, hey, if you decide to go and protest, if you decide to make your voice heard, you will not be penalized. We support you. And so I was very, very thankful that our superintendent took time to make sure that we all knew that as educators in her district. Um, I do want to say, I just wrote down a few points here as Alicia was talking. I think we all, I keep saying I think, I know we all need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's the only way to move this work forward. And I would love to see some kind of campaign around, I see you. I see you. I acknowledge you. I see you. I might have just given like the next big national campaign. I don't know. But I think there has to be work around that. Everybody needs to be validated no matter what they look like, no matter what they go through. I see you. I value you. I acknowledge you. Um, and then as far as our colleagues are concerned, and this goes for all of us, be okay with saying that you don't know something. And then put the action behind it and go find out. Don't just depend on your, your colleagues of color to do the work for you. And I think that's super important. Um, in regard to our, um, let's see, culture and climate of our schools, that, that starts again from the top down. So if you have that support from your superintendent, your associate superintendents, your administrators, that culture and climate that's established in your school establishes that trust between your um, colleagues and for your students. Um, technology, I do think, plays a huge um, part or could play a huge part in making sure that our students feel comfortable. Um, one of the things that we are adamant about here um, in my school district is making sure that our students, for example, have ebooks available that represent them. And it's for not just our black students, but all of our students, no matter what they're, whatever they are, whatever they identify with, we have ebooks available to make sure that they see themselves in our media centers all across our district. I also think it's super important that everybody shares their stories. Um, there's so much, what, I mean, Alicia, me and you need to touch base after this because I feel like you're in another body. Um, sharing your stories just really brings people to being people, and I think that's huge. Um, and then just really quick in regard to uh, just a couple things. When you are hiring teachers for your schools, are you hiring just a body for your school or are you hiring somebody that fits into the culture and climate of your schools? Are you really taking the time to examine and look at the fact that that person will make a positive impact on the students that are in your school? Because they might not. They might be a better fit for the school three miles down the road or 20 miles up the freeway. Um, so I really think we, we have to be intentional about that. And there are two questions that I think um, administrators can really just to themselves or teachers. Do your students feel welcome in your school and in your classrooms? And the second one is do your teachers feel, feel welcome? Really sit and, and think about that. These are not just bodies in the classroom. Um, those professional development days, let's stop making them check boxes for, you know, hey, um, we're going to meet about XYZ. If you can send it in an email, send it in, in an email. Um, but let's stop making them check boxes. Let's make them intentional so that we have these purposeful conversations. It has to be built into the culture of the school. Otherwise, it's just another checkbox. And I've sat through enough staff meetings in my life <laughs> to know that we have to kind of flip the switch and stop making these checkbox meetings and have them be super intentional about the work and giving it, like Alicia said, that built in time to make it happen. And it's not just something else on the calendar. Otherwise, it's like, oh, well, we went to the PD training on being, you know, culturally responsive, responsive. OK, well, we went to that training, but what did we do with it? So make it a part of the culture of your school. Thank you very much. And uh, for time's sake, I'm going to actually shift a little bit. And so let's I, I want to tie up what um, what you and Alicia just shared. Go to one question from the audience that I will share with Fernando and then we'll go to final uh, thoughts. Um, and and I, I want to thank you all for your contributions here. This is uh, it's it's been soul filling for me. Um, and, and to the point that Natasha shared, you know, if you're a school leader, you know, part of Part of the growth and the intentionality around this is dedicating time, putting words to actions and, 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 and accountability to those actions 
to where it shows that you're fully invested in your people. I mean, you think in terms of education, it's a people business and it's not a checkbox and it's not a series of standards. We're in the people business. And so if we invest in our people, then the investment will actualize itself in the overall culture and the experiences that um, that not only the students have, but also that the the teachers, the school leaders and uh, and across the board will have in this. And so what I want to address the question of Fernando real quick from um, one of the audience members, um, because I think this is a perfect question for you, and then we'll go to the final thoughts is, how do you see your story in your students and how does that affect your work? Uh, well, I mean, there's a, I think there's a natural inclination to uh, resonate or feel comfortable with people that look like you or come from similar backgrounds as you automatically. You automatically kind of just like, well, you're kind of like me. So you give them, you're more patient with them and you give them more of a pass. But that in and of itself implies a bias. Um, I try to, one of the things that I've tried to evolve to was to be a person that could capitalize on human potential, meaning I want every student, regardless of, of what background or how they identify, to be the best version of themselves. To that point, when I shifted my mindset, I saw myself in many students that didn't necessarily come from my personal background. I was like, oh, wow, you we're, we're very similar in terms of mindset. Uh, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm not, I'm basically gonna put my uh, students on blast. But for a while, I was uh, kind of the nerd nation teacher, meaning all the anime geeks and all the video game nerds would come and hang out with me in, um, in my classroom. Now, for those of you that don't know where I teach, I teach in a predominantly black high school. So for there to be a black nerd, that is, I mean, besides Urkel, you don't really see that in the mainstream. So you have a, a cross-section of different people from different backgrounds doing the same things within the context of America. So in that sense, I, I started to see myself in everyone, you know, that, that whole notion of, you know, there's only one race, there's the human race. Uh, DNA-wise, yes, we're very similar. Um, one of the things I do want to get in, because I didn't get to answer this part, I really want to answer this, is tech using technology in, in terms of reaching my students and amplifying their voice, tech is only the vehicle. We as educators are the driver. So we have to use that tech purposefully. One of the ways is to commit to the anti-racist work. And to a lot of your points, you can really see the value uh, of what a school district and a school values based on what kind of professional developments they have. If you are actually at, well, it's one thing to say, I want to be, anti-racist. I want to commit to the anti-racist work, but then only have one anti-racist workshop for one hour after school. That is not you committing to anti-racist work. So for, uh, forget about necessarily all the other things. This is the most pivotal thing in our nation. This is the one thing that I feel holds us back having racial inequities. So therefore, we as a society have to commit to the anti-racist work and put almost everything else on pause to just tackle this one issue that's been looming over our country since its inception. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on that, Fernando. You're absolutely right. And and to the point you just made, you know, you know, <clears throat> you know what a school district prioritizes based on what type of professional development they support and they offer. And, and no, the single day workshop is equates to what was shared, what one of you shared earlier is just another checkbox. Um, and so now just for time's sake, I do wanna uh, give you all an opportunity to just share um, with us here and then the audience, just some of your final thoughts and then ultimately your call to action on our conversation. So we'll do, we'll work our way around and then I'll share my final thoughts as we conclude what's been uh, a soul filling panel discussion for me. Um, so let's start off with Alicia, please. Just some th final thoughts and maybe even a call to action. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think we, we, we talked a lot about uh, the relationships with students. We talked about the relationships with colleagues. We talked about school mm -hmm. leadership. We talked about all those things working together. I think one thing that I wish we had more time to talk about, and, and Natasha touched on it too, was curriculum. Right. We, we have to talk about curriculum. Uh, it is it is time to to really 
it's been time to take a look at, at what we are offering to students in terms of the subjects that we teach. Um, and so I, I'm thinking about all the educators that are reading things now they've never read before, engaging in dialogue they've never been in before. That's great. We're, we're happy you're here with us, but now we need to sustain this into the fall and that's going to look like you dissecting your curriculum. What books are you offering to students? What are you teaching them in the class? What what bias exists in your content area? For example, I teach science. The first day of class is, is we talk about the, the the reason why my students cannot name scientists of color or they cannot name uh, a scientist who speaks Spanish or a scientist that's from the Philippines. And, 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 I, and I push them because I look at my students and I was like, well, you're Filipino. How come you don't know a Filipino scientist? And they're like, but, but I don't know, I was never taught. And it's like that, that discomfort, let's unpack that. Science is an absolute reflection of what's happening in society. And I'm tired of the, well, let's just get back to science and research. No, it's, it's mirroring society. You know, the inequities that we see there exist in science. So what I've been, been trying to be very meaningful about is thinking about what I'm teaching, what voices am I missing, um, who who do I need to add into the conversation? Where do I need to do more research? Because sure, I'm a biology major, but also my view of what I got from the degree uh, that I that I earned is, is going to be different too. Like I have bias within how I studied or, or where I studied and with whom I studied. And so I think my hope and my call to action is teachers take a hard look this summer. We all we all know that we we say we're taking a vacation, but we're all really looking at our lesson plans and our units for next year and the fall. Look at what you're teaching. Look at your curriculum. If it doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. If it doesn't feel like this is the time, it's not the time, you know, um, and and sit in that discomfort. Like Natasha said, we have to sit there and and do a little introspection uh, because otherwise those kids are going to come into the fall. Uh, it come into fall and into your classroom and it cannot be business as usual, but it, it cannot. It shouldn't have been, but even more so now we have to look at what we are teaching. Yes, thank you, and I, I uh, will respectfully request that we may have an opportunity to chat further in another discussion about the curriculum as well. Um, mm -hmm. Natasha, final thoughts, call to action, please. Thank you. Um, piggybacking on what Alicia just said, um, if I'm a student in a classroom, I can't be what I can't see. And so if I don't see myself in the curriculum or if my teacher is not making a conscious effort to make sure that I see myself in that classroom as a person and not just a body sitting in a chair, I'm not going to be successful. Um, I am so excited about the possibility of what can come out of all of this work. People, like Alicia just said, are reading things they've never read before. People are listening to podcasts they've never heard before. People are people are just taking everything in and I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful and I'm really excited about the work that can come out of this moving forward. Um, as far as call to actions, I would say get uncomfortable and be OK with that for everybody. Be OK, sit in that discomfort and do the work. It's not enough to read a book. You have to put action behind that. What are you going to do with it? If you listen to a podcast or you find something, I know I'm always on Instagram. Instagram is like blowing up right now. What are you doing with those resources that you're finding and how are you really internalizing them and making them be a piece of what you're going to do going forward? Um, I think it's super important too to make sure that you are exposing your kids. So a lot of the conversation is around adults and your like upper grade levels, but let's even have those uncomfortable conversations as much as you can with your younger students so that they grow up in a world where they all uh, where they understand and they feel valued and appreciated. Um, and you know, Fernando threw out a TED talk, TED talk earlier. I'm going to throw one of my favorites out, Rita Pearson. Every kid needs a champion. So I just encourage you all to be champions for all of your students going forward. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, just for the audience, we will have a collection of resources, uh, uh, links to what has been referenced. Um, what I do want to add before we go to final thoughts with Fernando, and then I'll share a few final things, is you've heard it now mentioned in varying ways that a student's experience should be essentially a mirror, a window, and I'll add a sliding glass door. Um, it's important that we cite our sources. That whole concept of a student learning experience was developed by Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop at The Ohio State University that a student should be able to see themselves reflected in a curriculum through an authentic representation. 
They should be able to learn about other cultural identities, uh, which is the, the window. And then in some cases, we provide experiences for them to step into or walk in another person's shoes. That's your sliding glass door. And then I'll add before we go to Fernando is uh, Dr. Debbie Reese, who is uh, an indigenous uh, college professor, said that sometimes that window has curtains because not every culture is just wide open for you to see. You have to make an effort to to um, uh, essentially pull the curtains back to then see into that culture. And so the more that we're able to provide students with those opportunities, the more it, it uplifts the students who are not, don't see themselves in the curriculum or not reflected in the curriculum, but it also broadens the, uh, the uh, perspective and the understanding for students uh, who don't necessarily uh, have that degree of uh, cultural identity that is being represented. So um, Fernando, final thoughts, call to action, uh, and then I'll share some final thoughts as we conclude. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It was an honor and a privilege to be around such amazing educators. Uh, I also want to dedicate this to my mom and dad who had the courage to come to this country considering that they had an uphill battle to fight and it propped me up to where I am today. So all honor to my parents. Uh, thank you so much. Um, one, of the, one of the calls to actions, one of the things I think I agree with what the other speaker said, one of the things I want to add and one of the things we could do tomorrow is to abolish standardized testing. I think that is a first step to uh, because what is standardized testing? But you, if you believe in standardized testing, you either believe one of two things. One, that white and Asian students are inherently superior academically to students of color or that standardized testing shows the racial inequities that are transpiring in our nation. So one either way. It, it, it is a institution that we've lived with for too long that isn't necessary to the to the education of our youth. Um, one of the, I want to share real quickly one of the ways they come up with questions in standardized testing is a part of the test is a test a, a question that will not be graded. If most of the student if most of the highest scoring students get it wrong, that is a question they don't use. Whereas if the most of the high, higher scoring students get it correct, now that question becomes part of the test in which you would be graded on. So it's a system that perpetuates itself in terms of white supremacy. So one of the things we can do is abolish uh, standardized testing because it does nothing for the advancement of education. It only makes people feel less than. It actually limits people in terms of the access they have to certain things. So. Uh, abolish uh, standardized testing. If you don't, if you didn't learn anything else from me, learn that standardized testing is a wrong institution and should be abolished. Thank you. All right. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for being a part of this panel. I want to thank everyone who's tuned in. Um, I want to give a special shout out to both Q and Microsoft who have uh, been phenomenally supportive uh, on the back end for us to have this opportunity to share our thoughts and to be a part of the learning experience that we've had with you all. Um, I will say on a personal level that, that Q and Microsoft are, are, are leaders in uh, what we are doing um, for a number of reasons, of, of which include the support that we've been provided, the platform that we are on, uh, as well as the understanding that we need to be the driver for the conversations that will help uh, all of us grow collectively and be supportive of education. Um, you know, the equity term that I use is a rising tide lifts all boats. And so uh, again, a special shout out. And then finally, I want to share with you all uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, in conclusion. That's from B.B. King. And that is the beautiful thing about learning is nobody can take it away from you. So hopefully you all have learned something from this particular panel discussion. You've got a lot of information, you've got some resources, but more importantly, hopefully there's been a lot of thought provocation. We look forward to seeing you all in our various social media spaces and hopefully at some point in our physical spaces, even if we have to maintain appropriate physical distancing. So again, uh, from the bottom of my heart, I wanna thank my panelists who are very dear and close friends of mine, um, Dr. Natasha, Rachel, Fernando Chavez, and Alicia Johal, and thank you all for tuning in. Thank you. Hasta la victoria, siempre. <laughs>